so perhaps I should take the microphone as well. Um, thanks all for coming in this full room. It's great to, it's great to see. Um, today I want to talk to you about logging and things that we can do in logging or that, that, that we do with log, logging when we have an application we want to report status so we can look at it after, a time, after some time. Um, before I get into the topic, a um, bunch of you may know me, but probably a bunch of you won't. So let me give you a brief introduction of who I am. I'm Markus Holtermann. I'm an engineer at Crate.io, which is a company, a German Austrian company. We build a database for IoT data. So when you have a factory and report and have sensor data and want to store that and do analytics on that, that database underneath where you store the data, that's what we do, what we build. I'm also a Django core contrib contributor, so I've been contributing to the Django code base itself and a bunch of other libraries in the Django ecosystem. But I'm mostly in the security team and operations team there these, these days. Now, where are you? Just to the other side, I don't have a speaker on here. There we go. Let me start with the problems we are facing these days when we talk about logging. We, we build web services that, or other services that are used by hopefully more than just 10 or 20 or 30 people, but maybe even hundreds, thousands, millions of people. And while most of the time things go smoothly and things work out the way they should, at some point they won't. And this is just the way software is and just the way we build our systems. And I don't think there's any way around that. But at the point where something goes wrong, we need to know what's happening and how we can fix that and how we, or how we can mitigate it in, in, in the meantime until we have a good proper fix that we are happy with. Now, when we look at how we do logging, and we're at Python, so I'm looking at how we do the logging in Python, we probably come up with something like this. And I realize this is a rather small Screen or canvas? Can you read that at the back? Good. Okay. Good luck. Um, so essentially, we're importing the logging module. We are creating a logger and then throw some text at it. Probably some or possibly some variables that are filled in for space, and that's it. Now, this is good. We we'll get a long way with that, and because I mean we've been doing that for years and, and ages. What we get when we look at the log files is something along these lines. So we have some timestamp in there, we have a log level, we maybe have a server name that where the whole thing happens. So if you have this whole server fleet and aggregate logs across from multiple servers, you would know on which server something happened. Now, after all, at the end, you have the log messages, and this is where the whole interesting thing or the, the, the information is. And when we look at this message, we can see a whole bunch of information there. We can see, and, or rather we can read, that somebody try to, tries to authenticate, tries to log into some system, presumably, presumably our system, and the authentication with Google failed. Well, what does it tell us? Except for the authentication, or that user wasn't able to log in. Well, not really anything, and we can't really do anything with this message. What we can is, we can see this message and understand what it, is, what it says, but we can't do anything with it. So there's not really much benefit in having it. I think our logging system and how we log these days is broken. Because when we log something and we can't do anything with it, what is the point of logging it in the first place? So as an engineer, when I look at log messages at 3 a.m. in the morning because something went horribly wrong and I've been broken up by some pager, I want to be able to look sleeping and sleep deprived without coffee at the screen and know, yep, I think I have an idea what's happening. And I dealt with that message that I just had there. When I look at this message, I would have a ton of questions. What is the IP address and the host that the server tried to connect to? And 
what was the timeout limit? Maybe it's some networking issue where we have a higher throughput and the 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 the, the, mess, the connection starts into some um, timeout because it's maybe some too low. Or how many other attempts were there of the whole thing going wrong? Was it a single message? Was it two, ten, hundred thousands? I mean, this is it has some impact on how much I'm going to care about trying to fix this at 3 a.m. And when I have a million log messages within an hour, finding one or two particular messages in there is going to be really tough. But even more important, well, were there other outgoing connections affected? Was it just this connection, what, this one time where our server tried to contact Google? Or was it like the entire server fleet not being able to connect to the internet or anything, anywhere? Maybe the hardware and the network interface is broken. Like, were other servers affected? Was it this one server because the hardware there failed or because something happened to the, to the software there, whatever? Or is it, again, the entire fleet? This is significant, this is important to know, to figure out how to address the problem. And I think we can get around or get and fix this or at least help us fix this and help us answer these messages, these questions when we add a bit of structure to our box. And what that means is that instead of logging this prose style plain text message where you need to know English or whatever language you're logging in, um, to, to understand and derive the meaning of this message, maybe we should do something like this. So instead of sending a whole text of prose to bring, in informa bring some information across, maybe we reduce that to an action, to an event, whatever you want to call it, and we provide a whole bunch of additional information that we have at hand at that point at to on top of it or along with it. And there's a Python library out there called Structlog, which provides an interface exactly for that, exactly like that. And when you look at this code compared to the one previously, it's pretty much exactly the same. The only difference here is that we have an underscore and a lowercase l here, because the other the, the Python logging library was derived from the Java library. Now, this is more Pythonic, but Structlog struct has a um, alias API where they do support the uppercase L as well. Now, anyway, when you lock this, this is what you get, would get in a, in a text message or in a console or wherever you lock to. Assume this is on, on a single line, unless you change the formatting. But essentially, you still get the same amount of information in there. Still now, this authentication provider failed, it's an error, you get a timestamp, you get a server, but also you know that the, the IP of the provider, the name, the timeout, and whatever additional information you would throw in to that list that we had before as well. Now, structured data, now that we have that in our files, would be great if we could have it somewhere where it's searchable. And maybe better searchable than using grep or arc. But what does structure even mean? So when we, when we want to use that structured information and share it between services or put it in a form where we can reuse it somewhere else, then we need to fit, define a format that we would use to, to share that. And then, well, let's think about a common sheet schema or com encoding that we could use for structured data. I'm not sure, I, I, I think there's this, this JSON that I've heard about. Like this is, when we have this record in a, or this object as a single line in a file, that's exactly the same information that we had just had here, which is a different way of presenting it, but it's the same information. Now, with that information, Let's put it somewhere where it's better searchable, where you can filter, where you can aggregate. Because when you can all of a sudden do something that's more than just reading through some lines, you can do something 
what, what you see is what you understand. When you have all the information aggregated in some database, some, some log collector, and are able to group, filter, and aggregate on, on specific attributes of those um, documents, then you can suddenly build graphs. And when you have graphs, you have something that you can visualize. And the human brain is something that can much easier detect something visually than going through millions of lines of code and or, or log messages and then trying to figure out the pattern in there. Like, when I show you this graph, and I tell you, this is 6 a.m., this is uh, 10 p.m. Can you actually re see that in the back? The color might, it's tough. Um, so essentially, we have one line that goes like this, up and down, up and down. And we have an another one that is just, well, not completely idling, but just has sm slow, sm um, smaller pe um, peaks at the bottom throughout. The one that goes this is the provider authentication succeeded, and the other one is failed. And when you, when you see this, or see those two graphs, you can essentially derive that throughout the day, this is your user base and user access according to the logins. For the other graph, you essentially see that, well, we have a general connection problem with some authentication provider. Not, we don't care about which one, but there is one throughout the day. Um, and this is just a general noise, I guess, of, hey, network blips somewhere along the way. Now, what we also have in here is the lower one, the lower curve here, has this one uh, tall spike at 12, on 12.30. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us that despite our expectation that some things are not working throughout the day, there's something odd, there's something off. We all of a sudden have a whole bunch of more, bunch more issues with logins, so something is going to be up, something is going to be not the way it should be. And we can see that, we can look at it, we can monitor on that, and get notified on that particular thing. So we can look at the ratio of, of issues that we have, of login issues that we have, and monitor and alert based on that. But more importantly, we can just see it by literally looking at this graph. Now, a picture says more than a thousand words. And this is true when we look at the next graph. And again, I'm sorry that it's really not visible from the backup problem, I suppose. We essentially have similar graphs. We have a blue one which goes up and down with three big spikes throughout the day, which is the number of debug messages. We have a green line which is pretty much just at the bottom. And we have a red one, which is similar to the yellow one we just had, which is also pretty much just at the bottom, but then has three ste um, steps or three inclines at 12, 12, 15, and 12, 30. And then, and then goes back to a flat line. Now, as an engineer or as a site reliable engineer, whatever you would look at it at the perspective there, at the job description there, what does a line like this for an error rate tell us? Well, it tells us that everything is fine. I mean, issues happen, but only a certain amount, which is the ratio we are okay with. But then all of a sudden, there's this slight increase, which is not to the degree of what we would expect as a from with a human eye, or as a, as a human, but which we can see this is off, but maybe it's not something we can detect easily with <coughs> automation or with monitoring. And then again, another slight increase in depending on how we have monitoring set up, maybe it's again something we can't detect, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden everything goes bonkers and everything falls apart. Now, when we think about the server fleet, where we deploy applications to, Maybe at 12 we deployed it to one, two servers 
of the entire fleet. Just enough to hope for our monitoring to go and like, yeah, now something is off, and please don't, please stop rolling out this release any further. But apparently, in this case, the error ratio was not high enough to stop the automation deployment to continue because at 12:15 it increases again, and maybe again this is below the threshold for this second stage rollout. There's only so many errors, but not enough to trigger this, the, the halting of the deployment. So, yep, everything. I mean, sure, there are, there are issues, but uh, it's it's still fine. So we go all in, and all of a sudden, the entire server fleet is broken. This is something where we can then detect on, yeah, no, everything is failing there, and this is not how it's supposed to be. But what we have here is that when you do the, perform the, the, the deployment and trigger it, like click a button, roll out, uh, trigger a stage rollout, and then look at gra the error graphs while it's happening for some time, you could intervene manually, assuming your, the system supports that. If you have regular log messages, this wouldn't be possible because you wouldn't be able to graph this. I mean, sure, there are ways, but not easily, not in a nice way. Um, structured data is significantly better use case for has a, a better usage for that. Now, so much about logging and visualizing the logs. Now, there's something else we can do with structured logging, which is commonly not really common with regular style plain log messages, which is called event tracing. What we essentially do is, whenever a request, whatever request that might be, comes into your system from the outside, you give it a request ID or trace ID or something like that. Correlation ID, there's several names. And you pass along this ID to every other service that you call that is within your, within your control. And that service is going to reuse that ID. Which means that when a user comes into one service, or comes into your, your the, the, the first service, and you call off something else, and something else there, and, and have nested calls, everything there, all the log messages along the way, will ha you will attach this trace ID to. And you will, would be able to do that, for example, when you look at Django by using a middleware. You have created, you have a middleware within the, when the request comes in, you look if there's a trace ID already present. If not, you continue, uh, if, if it's not present, you create one. If it's, um, if it's not, if it's not present, if it's not present, you create one. If it's present, you, do, you reuse that. You can do something similar for the user object and attach these and this information to the to the structured logging. Oops. So the benefit of structured logging here and the event tracing is that when you then go and have your logs in a searchable data store where you can filter on the trace ID, for example, you can see, hey, this one request here failed. Let's look at the entire call stack and all the log messages that belong to that a user did something. And you get all the logs sorted by time in the order they appeared. And with that, you can retrace the event and retrace what the user did or what user did and what happened as a result of that. Now, with all the logging, we need to consider what that has for implications on European users. For example, you don't want to log private or personal information if you can prevent that. So logging an ID of a user should probably be more than enough to identify that user without exposing email addresses or passwords in, in logs. Like, never log any secrets, ever, unless you want to be in a list of companies like Facebook, GitHub, Twitter, um, <laughs> Monzo apparently as well, a couple of um, months ago. Uh, 
seems to be common these days to do that. Please don't. Um, also ensure that log, uh, your log data is stored securely and not in a world readable data store. There are databases that are commonly world readable. I'm not going to name names. And there's also cloud so service providers who have storage options where you can store documents which are very easily published completely open to the internet. This is also something where you don't want to store logs and have them, well, you might want to store logs there, but then please make sure they are not world readable, or God forbid, world writable. <laughs> and the best way to, to actually accomplish at least the former to not log secrets and, and personal information is by, by logging things explicitly. You can throw the whole dictionary of an object in, in the log message or in the co log co logging context, and then just, yep, it's be fine. Or you can just say, okay, I want to have the name and the ID there, or like this attribute and this attribute, and that's fine. Right, coming towards the end of my talk and to the question of the title that probably all of you are going to ask, well, who the heck is Frank Taylor Jr.? Well, Frank Taylor Jr. is a character from, well, not a character, it's an alias, from somebody called, um, called Frank William Abagnale Jr. And who of you know the film or the movie Catch Me If You Can? That's more people than I expected, but okay, yeah, that's good. Um, so I'm just briefly cover the story. So essentially, it's an um, American who figures out how to forge bank checks and do a whole bunch of other things and get around in the States, in the United States, for several years without being caught and just committing fraud in the millions. By, for example, and this is the whole bank um, bank check. Uh, forgery, changing one number in the front or in, in, on the check, which means the check was delivered to the other um, to the other side of the country, which took about two weeks. To then tell, have the bank there tell, yeah, no, this check is invalid. Go all the way back. At which point, he was somewhere else. So, staying in a hotel for a couple of nights, paying this check that's invalid but needs to go across the country and back for the hotels to go, yes sir, you, oh no, you checked out already. So, essentially the idea here is tracing that, um, tracing Frank William Abagnale was hard and almost impossible, and it took years to eventually you know, catch him. Now, I've prepared, pre prepared a demo, which I won't show because of the time, but also because I'm scared of giving demos on, on stage. <laughs> So instead, there's a GitHub repository with the documentation and examples and codes and all the things in there of, um, of a way of how you event tracing and logging, structured logging could look like. This is an index page of, essentially it's a Docker Compose setup, Docker Run, or Docker Compose app. It should just work, <coughs> computers. Please let me know if it doesn't. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus. Unfortunately, Marcus is used the full time, so there's no time for questions, but he's around for the conference, so you can get hold of him if there's anything more you want to know. Uh, there's another session in five minutes, so if you're here for that, please stay where you are. Otherwise, then please vacate so other people can come in. Thank you very much.